Okay, um, thank you everybody for these, these expert talks. I um, have been given the job of quote unquote putting it all together, a strategy for managing your lab. And I think what my goal really in working out this talk was to do what John uh, Dent just talked about, which is we're uh, going through this transition in which labs may become a cost center for hospitals. And so what I hope that you get out of this talk is a case that you can make to your hospital administrators about why it might be useful to invest in your, uh, your echo lab in the future rather than trying to like strip it down. And with that, I would also like to recognize this as the 10 year anniversary of Pam Douglas publishing the Dimensions of Care framework for cardiovascular imaging. And really important document just to show that it's been it's been a 10-year process uh, of just getting into what exactly are the dimensions of quality and what are the things that an echo uh, lab should manage. And actually, I, um, it, uh, Dr. Patel, you know, with the AUC group, he published this when it came to looking at the value equation for cardiovascular procedures. And these are the elements, uh, basically an adaptation of what Dr. Douglas published with her think tank document. 10 years ago on the elements that should be managed by a lab. And so how do we do that in the real world? Let's just assume that appropriate exams are ordered, the staff's educated and skilled, and that the basic lab structure is in place, and that timely accurate studies improve patient outcome. And maybe it's even an accredited lab, <laughs> okay? Not a requirement in, in all labs, but among Echo Lab's goals, are basically could get a lot of patient echoes scanned, diagnosed, treated, and safely discharged ASAP. How do we really do that? Echo frequently is viewed as essential to different phases of patient care. For inpatients, echo delays definitely, in our experience, increase length of stay and become more costly under the new uh, systems that we're talking about. And there's a lot of pressure from doctors administ and administrators for the labs to do more at a time where you can imagine that they might uh, want to cut things. And hasty and inaccurate exams result in poor, poor patient care, and I would think also uh, their poor metrics. And so also hospital administrators may not fully understand how modern echo works or what an echo exam entails, yet they can be an important decision makers in the process. So how can this be managed in the real world? And really it's an in ongoing analysis of faculty in uh, facility infrastructure, lab infrastructure, and the protocols that are performed, where they're performed, and, and most importantly, I think nowadays, is the staff and the leadership. So a workflow analysis really looks at from the time of order through the final report. And this is how we reach the ordering physician and incorporate the echo results into patient care. And the reality, in fact, is that design fac the facility designs may be antiquated. New forces are competing for echo lab resources and putting new clinical practice guideline recommendations into clinical practice is very challenging. The workforce is changing around us. Technology moves very quickly but may but be, be updated slowly. The other reality is there can be a dramatic time lag between identified lab needs and funding and this leads to inefficiency. And inadequate analysis and reporting pro products really stand in the way, I think, of how quickly we can move uh, studies through the lab and what kinds of quality metrics we can report realistically given the tools that we have today. And I just wanted to uh, share, you know, a little bit inside our lab and, and see if this reflects in any way how your facility might have developed over time. I, I think historically a lot of our hospitals had a religious or university uh, uh, foundation. Uh, I only put 1996 in there because that's when I arrived at my laboratory, and that was in the videotape era. And if you look, uh, you know, we, we went uh, digital a little bit late, 2006, with our first Echo Pax product. And it's been 10 years since we really uh, looked at changing this over. Now, the dotted line at the right represents the last three years. In our lab, in my experience, the change that's been going on is really crazy. I mean, we are almost on our knees on a daily basis trying to deal with some of these issues. In fact, our hospital system was purchased by a new owner three years ago. We're at the state where our echo pack system needs to be replaced three years ago. We actually went live with it uh, four weeks ago while I was walking on this, working on this talk. Uh, so what are the challenges that are happening? 
Uh, we have new HR systems to integrate into the lab and into the hospital. These are very resource and time intensive to implement. And at our uh, society level, we have 18 ECHO guideline documents that have been published or updated in the last three years. This is in phenomenal. It's a lot of information to incorporate into your lab, and we've talked about the use of strain, structural heart disease, how to incorporate new stress protocols, and staff turnover can be massive. We've seen this go up in recent years, and also many of our machines are old at a time when we've got new administrators coming in and just sort of wanting to see what's going on. And so how do we deal with this in a new value reimbursement uh, age? So the problems I've outlined above, the goals for my create, uh, discussion are really to create a framework for you to look at your lab and just to find some real world uh, tricks of the trade. And I think, as Pam alluded to, and also um, Mike, don't get discouraged. I mean, we are looking at trying to get low hanging fruit at first. You know, what are the things that we can improve? And this is always a work in progress. The framework really is that it's a team. Teamwork's required, and I'm stealing from our new fearless leader, Alan Klein, who used this at a retreat to look at boys in a boat. How do you put together a team where everybody's rowing in the same direction? And so I'd encourage you to look at your lab as a team and ask these questions. Where are we playing? What are we playing? Who's on our team? And what tools do we have to work with? I'm not going to talk about the, who are the other competitors. I think what we want to think about is what's best for the patient and being the most efficient in our lab and not uh, you know, compare ourselves with our benchmarks so much. So where are we playing? Uh, this is our playing field or an example of what it might be. This is my medical center hospital that was initially, say it was built in 1928. And then in 62, we added something on it, you know, a wing for the emergency room. There was a new patient tower. And around the early 80s, the echo lab was put in place. Okay? And you may be able to relate to this if you work in many modern medical centers. This has happened over the last few years. And how does the echo lab relate to all of these infrastructures that are put in place that may have remote distances, variable levels of connectivity, and uh, really, really in a physical way affect what you do. So these are some of the issues that you might look at. I think it's just important, per, point for your, you know, important for your lab to have a diagram of your facility and where are all the places that you have to go, where are the patients, and how do you get the images back to your analysis center and get the reports out. It can be very complex and vary throughout your facility. Some of the issues are, uh, you know, what parts of the hospital have uh, connectivity from either a, a hardwired uh, connectivity to the PAC system or can use wireless, or are you literally having to wheel that machine back and forth? And, you know, you can say to your hospital administrator, you know, look, our experienced technicians, if you just line the studies up or if you send them out on portals, they're, they're, they can realistically do from eight to ten exams a day. You take that same sonographer, put them in the lab, and they're having to sit around and wait for studies, or you take an inexperienced sonographer, you're going to cut that down to maybe six or seven studies a day. So that's a, that's a significant cost of not investing in your facility. And at the end of the day, you know, our facility, actually we're going to replace the entire hospital, but that's three years away. So we do have to deal with this now. Uh, this is, this is an image that I was able to collect. You know, I, this, is a, <laughs> this shows that in a, in, a, in a facility, the only thing that never ages is your building and your cardiology fellows. <laughs> there you can see our, our David Hernandez, one of our, our experienced sonographers going portable in 2003, who were like 13 years later, the fellow's the same exact age. He's just a little taller and, you know. So, and, but look at the hallway behind it. It was built in 1954. We literally cannot hook that part of the hospital up to our lab. So the next thing is, what are we playing? I think it's very helpful to look at the tasks that your lab are doing. And you can kind of take an a la carte approach here. Not every lab is doing everything. I've kind of included what uh, you know, a, a lab might be doing in the 21st century here. A lot of different things that we weren't even doing three, four years ago have not necessarily been efficiently coordinated into our lab. Now, who's in our lab? These are, here are the tasks. We have a medical staff, and medical staff have different uh, roles. We have a technical staff, and we have a nursing staff. So I think it can actually be helpful you to write the names down of these people that are in your lab. And what type of responsibility do they have? 
and how do they relate to the different tasks that you want to do. Our medical and uh, technical directors, we expect them to be pretty familiar with all the jobs that are done in our lab. But there may be people that they're primarily going to read uh, uh, their congenital studies. They can re re read uh, routine echoes and maybe go to the OR because they're doing congenital cases. Uh, you may have some, some uh, workers in the lab that, that are doctors that come and read their own cases and they'll do stress echo, but they're really not expected to be involved in, in uh, structural heart disease. And the same with sonographers. And, you know, this, uh, the, what are the expectations of your staff? You can outline these. These may be assigned by level of training and commitment. You might rotate by different days of the week. You might have what we actually have a system of core uh, MDs, so we can divide up these like complex work, and so it doesn't really fall on one single person to always go to the lab for structural heart diseases. This area is growing, very time consuming. And same with the sonographers, duties may be assigned by level of training and days of the week schedule. What are the tools now? Not all machines are equal, so you can uh, match the machines that you have to the types of tasks that you want to perform in your lab. And you have to point this out to your administrators that some of these cheaper carts don't necessarily do everything. And they have uh, a half-life, too. So machine issues that you might come up with when you really get down and look at your lab are different vendors, different machine age, different analysis packages. Do they, they actually cost money? And you might want to have a list of, of uh, downtime, repair time, and a replacement cycle can be developed with your staff so that they're not just out of left field getting a request for brand new equipment uh, after something breaks down. Um, now, development of your sonography team, uh, issues appropriate to training uh, based on the types of protocols they're doing. You know, this is a real investment in time and getting your sonographers up to speed. I'm going to go back just a little bit as far as managing your data. This can be a huge um, issue. It's very time intensive to collect the data, but then also to analyze it. It takes time to do, but it also takes time to undo the work that's done by your lab if you don't have the correct lab flow. And this can vary uh, from lab to lab how you want to organize this if you're really uh, have ex the expectations that you're doing all the analysis on the cart and then it's coming over or you're kind of like what we do in the bottom is is we have some basics that are done on the cart and then a lot of offline analysis but then who's doing it and what's their capability what's their training in order to do that and is every individual in the lab operating at the top of their ability or do you have physicians that are spending many hours a day doing parasternal long axis and EF measurements on a, on a workstation when really, you know, your, your sonographers could do this very quickly. You know, what exactly is the flow in your lab? This is just an example of what we might, you know, at a minimum expect our sonographers to do on the cart and then all the other fancy stuff that can do into that. Managing incorporation of new guideline recommendations into clinical practice can be very tough. Uh, we had 18 new documents go into the going to the pod over the last three years. Um, I think this is actually, it, it's a good thing. A lot of these guidelines needed updating. We've got a very robust menu of guidelines documents now. I think we're at a really good time uh, to start to do this and actually start to guide ourselves and industry on how to really uh, do this. We've got a lot of um, clinically meaningful guidelines now that actually clarify cutoff values. They really lend themselves to incorporation into a database so that you can get some of these metrics in there in a real way. Uh, I'm going to show you some ways that we've done it. Uh, improved reporting tools can be very helpful, in other words, as far as, as, as uh, improving our lab's workflow and efficiency. Uh, ideally, the reporting tool should be quick and accurate and link to us with our referring MD. In the real world, many of these reporting tools have dated information. They're poorly organized and you experience a slow death by a thousand clicks when you're reading some of these studies. Uh, and it can be a real sea anchor for the lab. So again, what can we really do in the real world? These are examples of, of uh, types of reporting systems that labs have used. Uh, Grow Your Own, which has several, several disadvantages. Also, the commercial products out there may also have disadvantages. And what we've really done in the real world is it's very simple. We created cheat sheets 
for some of these things, literally going through some of the new guidelines. And along with industry, we could develop more flexible reporting tools. This is an example of left atrial volumes from our new updated guidelines uh, for um, volume assessment. You know, you can go through there and load the uh, new cutoff values for different uh, structures, give the reader uh, a cheat sheet actually in the report, and you're actually given the, the cutoff number. And this, I think, really encourages people to do more quantitative measurements. Very easy to, to do, except if you have a reporting system that doesn't allow you to change the pull downs in the content. Diastolic dysfunction. This is from the newly reported diastolic function guideline in April, and it really helps to post some of these cheat sheets in the lab, and it can be very easy to then load your reporting tool with these types of comments literally copied right out of the guidelines documents, and so that allows your, your fellows, your techs, you know, really uh, go in and link their um, analysis of the data, their integrated assessment into a very, you know, a simple reporting metric. And then this is how it might look when you pull it in there. This is a, our vendor has cooperated with us on developing some flexible tools. And this shows how you can put the level of diastolic function there without going crazy. Take something much more complicated, near and dear to my heart. This can, this can shut you down. If you start doing lots of ramp studies in your lab, how can you really do this? Well, on the left, copied directly from the guideline document is your cheat sheet with the content. And then you can go in here and just, just quickly pull down the appropriate numbers, delete things that don't apply, and get your report done in more real time. And finally, who's on our team? High staff turnover is fatal. The reality check is that lab culture, knowledge base, and productivity cannot be maintained if you have high staff turnover. And I think it's important to ask if you have a culture clash in your lab. We actually experienced this in a big, big way recently. There's this issue of baby bloomers and millennials. That, are y'all familiar with that? Yeah. How many millennials are in the room? Awesome. Well, there are going to be more. I, this is what a baby boomer looks like. The people that are kind of in this room or at this table. And they, so who's in charge in the lab? This can be a huge issue. Millennials were born in 1982 through uh, 2002 cause generation, social generation, how do we really relate to these people that are just more uh, command and control uh, uh, driven? And, but the reality is that as of 2016, millennials are the largest percentage of our workers. So we have to deal with that and creating a millennial friendly workplace. Uh, these are some quotes lifted from, uh, you know, an analysis of the millennial. And I think the important thing is that millennials don't work for you, they work with you. And you just have to understand that they're not lazy, but they're very productivity oriented and not time oriented. They can be quite passionate about their brand. And so if you can make your lab your brand and make it proud of it, you can, these guys are awesome and can really work with you. They hate to just wait around and not do anything if they're just waiting to punch a time clock, but you give them a QI activity, they're gonna own it and do a good job. They love frequent feedback and directed towards growth and advancement. And I'm not saying that with any facetiousness or scorn. It's a good thing. Um, so this leads to the advanced cardiac sonographer thing. I mean, I think this was very prescient. It really lends itself to the development of the millennials in our labs. It really um, is a way that gives them a ladder towards getting to a higher level in, that, in the lab in a structured way and also proving to administration that you have an employee that's valued. This, you know, this is an employee that can't get this degree unless they've worked for seven years. You've got metrics that show that they can do special procedures, very uh, large knowledge base and skilled set. And the other thing I think we have to look at is just there's new knowledge on creating the perfect team. This was published in the New York Times Magazine last February. and. This is a new area, and I think we can get more knowledgeable in this and have our labs be more cohesive. Why some groups thrive and some faltered, and Google actually looked at 180 teams around their company exhaustively, and because they use teamwork a lot, they could not find any patterns. It, it was really three years of work until they started realizing that there's something called group norms or team cultures that override individual behaviors. These are unspeak, unspoken rules of working in groups that can be either positive or negative. There's something called equality and distribution of, con, of conversational turn-taking. 
So if you're in a QI meeting trying to solve your lab's prob problems, as long as everybody gets a chance to speak, they'll probably do well. But if you have one or two people or a small group that speak all the time, then the creative intelligence actually can decline in a group. So this is very interesting uh, to look at when you're considering uh, this. And this relates you know, the terms like social, uh, uh, average social sensitivity. Uh, and so when you are in the lab accreditation process, really these are minimum standards for your lab structure. They're quite in, uh, easy to implement as we've already discussed. But how do you get to that higher level? In this quarterly meeting process is where you can encourage participation and develop that community, the lab brand, your group norms, I look at, look at what's going on. And at the bottom I think is the most important thing. I have not really done this over the years, but I'm really uh, tired of having a lab meeting and we decide how everything's going to be done and then hospital administration just can undo it and they really need to be involved in this process going forward I think and understand what we do. Uh, so in the, the real world we have to examine all of these issues very carefully and hospital administration should become more engaged. Thank you.